In a quiet corner of the Sussex coastline lies the village of Pagham. This has been my home for the last 22 years, but I've only recently started to appreciate the nature and biodiversity on my doorstep. With its rich agricultural fields and local RSPB harbour reserve, spanning over 629 hectares, the reserve supports an abundance of wildlife. This short film will take you through my year at Pagham Harbour. As the January frost settles in, the reserve may seem fairly quiet at this time of year, but if you look closely, there is much to see. barn owls on the morning hunt. Her soft feathers allow her to glide silently through the air with ease. Her heart-shaped facial disc collects and directs the sound towards her inner ears. You can tell this is a female barn owl by the black spots on her chest and underside of the wings versus that of a male which bears no spots here. The owl's low light vision is highly movement sensitive. Anything that moves is instantly noticed, but anything that keeps still and silent is usually ignored, stopping occasionally mid-flight as she hears her prey in the undergrowth. until something promising is spotted. She dives. But misses. In winter, food can be scarce, as her prey such as mice and vole are less active in the winter months, making it difficult to hear and see them. With not much success, she leaves to scout further afield in hope she may find enough food to survive this winter. The appearance of snowdrops in late February shows that winter is coming to an end and that spring is not too far around the corner. From January till March, Roebuck antlers will be covered in velvet. This velvet is essential to antler growth in preparation for the rutting season, 
which occurs between mid-July to mid-August. This is when they will assert their dominance for the right to mate. By March, bluebells have emerged and the dawn chorus continues to grow. These are the first signs spring has arrived. The reserve is bustling with life, as waders and wildfowl linger well into spring, while smaller migrants arrive, such as the sedge, reed and willow warblers, which have overwintered in Africa, south of the Sahara. In April, many birds on the reserve will be preparing their nests, ready to lay their eggs. Swans in particular work as a pair, constantly maintaining their nests so it stays high enough above the water, so the eggs stay warm while the parents take turns to incubate them. May is the peak time of year to see new life on the reserve. With ducklings the first to emerge, posting up to 12 in their brood, Coot chicks are not too far behind, typically with six chicks in one brood, which are usually split between parents. And after incubating the eggs for six weeks, the cygnets have hatched. At roughly 250 grams once hatched, they may seem tiny in comparison to their parents, but in just six months they could weigh up to six kilograms, almost half the weight of an adult swan. Cygnets can take to the water right away, but as it's their first day in the world, they sometimes need a little encouragement to leave the comfort of their nest. The parents will nurture their young until they're at least a year old before forcing them to leave to find new territory. While the bird life on the reserve is thriving, slightly further inland, a litter of four fox cubs have recently emerged from their den, commonly known as an earth. With rather woolly orange fur, this makes them roughly four to six weeks old, as the first two to three weeks of their lives, they are usually deaf, blind, and with greyish brown fur and completely dependent on their mother for food and warmth. But this brand new world comes with its challenges, as they are not alone. If their mother risks hunting early in the afternoon, this can mean roaming the semi-rural landscape they live between. Land that could soon be consumed by concrete and houses. The run to the litter, the fourth and final cub, is noticeably smaller and hobbling from an unknown injury. Only time will tell the outcome of this little one, as on average foxes only survive between one and three years. With the cover of darkness, their mother takes them outside the safety of the earth to teach them what they will need to survive this ever-changing landscape they live in. A 
subtle groan indicates the little one is hungry. They still require their mother's rich milk to supplement their lack of solid foods they would usually be eating by now. After only a matter of weeks, the eldest cubs have and continue to grow rapidly compared to the run to the litter, as they tend to be first in line for their mother's milk and solid food. The eldest cubs have noticeably longer legs, developed facial structure, and have molted their woolly fur. As evening draws in, the cubs will roam their pocket of green space before venturing out with the cover of darkness. They are also constantly smelling their surroundings. Not only do they use their sense of smell for hunting, but they also use it for identifying territories held by other foxes, which are marked with their pungent urine and scent glands. This is essential for young foxes to learn quickly, as it will play a huge role in their adult life. It is now June and summer has arrived. As the cubs continue to develop well, these two siblings seem to spend the most time together. Play fighting from an early age helps not only develop their muscles, coordination, but later hone hunting skills. It also helps establish a hierarchy that will often affect which cub gets the most food. Normally by six to eight weeks old, the cubs would be weaned off their mother's milk, but this particular cub was suckling at the beginning of June, roughly ten weeks old, suggesting they are not finding enough solid food, but nevertheless, all four cubs are still alive and growing steadily despite the struggles they face. With summer in full swing, the berries, grassland and insect life is flourishing. As the hot evening draws in, a female roe deer emerges from the long grass with her newborn fawn.
Although mating usually occurred in January and August from the previous year, in this period the fertilised egg does not implant and grow until January. This is thought to be an adaptation to avoid giving birth during the harsh winter. For the first few months of their lives, fawns are left hidden in the long grass, and only visited by their mother for short periods to suckle. They then begin to accompany their mother before eventually setting out to find territory of their own. As the tide drops and the mudflats are exposed to the air, it becomes a buffet of worms, bivalves and cockles for wildfowl and wading birds. Just like these black-tailed godwits, which have travelled all the way from Iceland, Using their long beak, they plunge deep into the mud in search of their next meal. With resting water nearby, they can wash their catch before ingesting. As the black-haired godwits scour the mudflats for their food, a little egret preens its feathers at the water's edge. A common sighting at Pagham Harbour, standing up to 65 centimetres tall, it is hard not to miss. As the harbour is at low tide, this is the best time to observe the little egret as it hunts the shallow water, using its slender beak, keen vision, and its feet to shuffle the soft sediment underfoot. It disturbs any fish and crustaceans that are hiding beneath. But the little egret is not just limited to one hunting technique. As it scuttles over the shallow water, it can scare the fish with its size and speed, making for easy pickings. As the little egret ventures off in search of new hunting ground, a common tern emerges from its plunge into the water. Common, little and sandwich tern migrate here for the summer, especially sandwich tern, which breed on designated islands safe from predation.
the humble oyster catcher, a large, stocky, black and white wading bird with a long, orangey red bill, slightly shorter than that of a godwit, but nonetheless uses it for a similar method of searching the mudflats for worms. Although their name derives from catching oysters, they predominantly eat bivalves, including cockles and mussels. By August, the black-tailed godwits have already started molting their summer plumage, revealing a light grey plumage, ready for winter when they return to Iceland. By the end of August, the four cubs have started to spend less time together, as they prepare to find their own territories. After three months have passed, these two siblings seem to have a close bond, as they still play and fight together. But as they grow older, their fights may seem more intense. As autumn takes hold over the reserve, spring and summer migrants have now departed, while winter waders and wildfowl flocks grow dramatically. With the setting sun, starling and wading birds gather in their hundreds for safety before they roost for the night. A short-eared owl has migrated from France to overwinter here in the UK. He uses the south coast as a stop-off to rest and refuel before heading further inland. By October, large flocks of dark-bellied Brent geese, which have travelled all the way from North Russia, arrive in their thousands all along the south coast to overwinter here in the UK.
When the tide is low, they will feed on the plentiful seagrass across the harbour, but when the tide is high, they will use the harbour as a place to gather into large flocks before setting off for coastal fields to graze from.